Uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. My name is Stephen Staples. I'm the National Director of Research and Advocacy for the Canadian Health Coalition. The Canadian Health, Health Coalition is an advocacy organization uh, direct, dedicated to the preservation and improvement of public health care in Canada. And you are joining uh, the webinar called Work, Study, Pay Taxes, But Don't Get Sick. And we are launching a new report by Emilio Rodriguez of Citizens for Public Justice and Tracy Glynn with the Canadian Health Coalition. We're going to begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Indigenous people are the traditional guardians of this land and that we call Canada, in which we gather today for this webinar. We acknowledge the historical oppression of lands, cultures, and the original peoples of this country, and we know we have a role to play on, in the path to decolonization that we share together. We recognize our duty to fight for Indigenous rights, to be restored and commit ourselves to the journey of healing. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Now I'd like to introduce our host and co-author of the report, Work, Study, Pay Taxes, But Don't Get Sick, Tracy Glynn. Tracy is National Director of Operations and Projects of the Canadian Health Coalition, my colleague, and she's also a professor at St. Thomas University in Fredericton. Take it away, Tracy. Thanks, Steve. Um, so it's my, uh, yeah, my pleasure to, to introduce today's panelists uh, and to, to also fill in as moderator while our colleague Anne Legacy Dowson, uh, our usual superstar host, um, is on leave. I'll try my best to, um, to fill Anne's shoes. Uh, so today we're joined by Emilio Rodriguez. Uh, Emilio is the Refugee Rights Policy Analyst with Citizens for Public Justice. So Citizens for Public Justice is an organization committed to social and environmental justice in Canadian public policy. Emilio is the, the lead author of the report that we are launching today uh, on barriers to healthcare uh, based on immigration status. Uh, originally from El Salvador, uh, Emilio migrated to Canada in 2016, uh, quickly becoming involved in, in refugee and migrant rights advocacy uh, by being a founding member of a refugee sponsorship organization and uh, coordinating public education projects with, with UN agencies. Uh, Emilio has published research on forced migration with, with Canadian and, and U.S. Uh, think tanks. And also Emilio is set to complete a Master of Arts in International Affairs from Carleton University in December 2023. We're also joined today uh, uh, by Deepen Budlakoti, uh, an Ottawa resident who cannot access health care because the, the federal government refuses to recognize his citizenship. The, the Canadian Health Coalition has joined other human rights organizations and labor unions in supporting the restoration of DPEN's citizenship. Um, uh, DPEN is an advocate for the, for the human rights of prisoners and, and people with precarious immigration status. Our third panelist, Carrie Ann Burnett, unfortunately can't join us today. Uh, Carrie Ann is a seasonal farm worker from Jamaica who is fighting to access health care in Nova Scotia uh, for her cancer treatments. So while Carrie Ann can't be with us, uh, we do have a, a short video uh, with Carrie Ann uh, that was just released, just released yesterday. Uh, that yeah, that we would like to open this event since it it gives a face and a voice to what inadequate access to healthcare for for migrants in Canada looks like. Uh, and then joining us today is Stacy Gomez, who who manages the one no one is illegal Nova Scotia's migrant workers program. And Stacy has been supporting Carrie Ann and and can answer your questions about uh, Carrie Ann's struggle to to access healthcare in Nova Scotia. So we're going to go to uh, the video uh, with Carrie Ann. Um, I'm hoping everything's going to work just fine. <laughs> um, Okay, just a second. Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Stacy Gomez. I'm with No One Is Legal Nova Scotia Migrant Workers Program. We're here today with Carrie Ann Burnett, who is a migrant farm worker uh, from Jamaica. She is uh, seeking access to public health care so that uh, she can get the treatment that she needs for cancer. My name is Karen Burnett. I am a migrant farm worker from Jamaica. I'm 42 years old. I have six children, um, including two sons, four daughters. I have two grandkids, a boy and a girl. I came to Canada in April 2022. I started working at a strawberry farm where after two months of working, I was feeling a lot of pain went to the hospital. I was, I did a surgery there, removing an abscess from my belly. Two weeks after I removed the abscess, it was back again. I was in a lot of pain again. I went back to the hospital. I was told that the abscess had come back. I went to another hospital to draw it. When I went there, um, they did a CT scan and the abscess had reduced from four centimeters to two centimeters. So the doctor said I would need to draw it. Anyway, I was sent back to the previous hospital. I was there, um, still feeling pain. So the doctor said she would do a biopsy and a pap smear, which she did. Then I was diagnosed um, in September with cancer, cervical cancer, two places. Now I am supposed to get treatment at Halifax, which I don't have any health care because I usually have a private health care when I was employed. So the farm, I, I am no longer employed to the farm. When they found out that I was sick, I was actually put out, sent back home to Jamaica. I did not take the flight back home because I was told by the doctor to stay here for a treatment. They actually booked two flights for me. I refused on taking the flight. So I'm here in Canada trying to seek some help to get med medical attention here. Back in Jamaica, when we hear the words cancer, it's very scary because most people I know in Jamaica, when them diagnosed with cancer, they died. I have experience of my aunt. She died in 2005 with cancer. So it's kind of challenging to think about having cancer and going back to Jamaica. Moreover, the healthcare system there is kind of messy. So you would be there like in lines waiting to get treatment. So you'll have an appointment and the appointment will be like the next two years or probably a year to treat or so forth. So I don't think I, would, I want to experience that based on the death of my aunt. I am more scared of being dead because of uh, lack of, of health care there. Is like um, the, the, the length, the wait time there for you to get treatment is very bad. So I don't think I, I would rather to go back to Jamaica to obtain treatment. Well, the treatment hasn't started as yet, but so far I um, I've been prepped for the treatment. So I actually get the markings for the, the radiation because I'll receive radiation and chemo. So I actually got the tattoos for the radi radiation. I'm going um, later in the week to get an, a CT scan for the chemo. So I think it's going to start pretty soon. Actually, I'm staying at a guest house here in Halifax. I uh, had reached out to a couple of people and one of them was able to sent me to a guest house. Now the people at the guest house, they are many nights. So based on the, my story, they had agreed for me to stay there for a little while. So I'm just staying there now. Well, I I don't think I have a private insurance anymore. It was 100000 I had used up over 80000 No, not being with the company, I don't know if they discontinued the insurance or, or not. I've been reaching out to them, not getting an answer. I have an estimate at the hospital now that my, my treatment would cost $64,880. I have had help from organization. Um, no one's illegal. 
the ABSW um, social worker at the hospitals, that's Victoria Gen General Hospital. And I have had support from um, other people here that are from Jamaica that um, have heard my story and they have reached out to support me. So I have a, quite a um, couple of people that is there helping me to go through this fight. Actually, I feel good about it. I am more like confident on beating this. The fact that I have support from people, especially people from out of my country, Canadians, that I, I don't know and they are willing to come aboard to help. I am very grateful. I I feel okay. The only problem I have is like um I'll have a lot of pains during the days and I'm like always bleeding, but I'm okay other than that. Um, actually, I would, I would say yes, because um, nobody know what the situation may be tomorrow. There are a lot of Jamaicans here and other migrant workers here, which they come here for work. Nobody wants to be sick, but eventually you get sick. No, we are working like $13.35 per hour. There is no way you get sick and you have a, a bill at the hospital. How are we going to pay these bills? So actually, I'm not really doing this for myself alone. I'm doing this for every farm worker that is not that does not have access to public health care here in Canada. Well, um, I would say they could support by donating to my GoFundMe page as well as they could, whoever can reach out to the, the Minister of Health and have them know what is happening and see how best they can look into the situation and consider to help us. Yes, I'd like to say special thanks to all the people that have contributed and all the people that had reached out to me through my GoFundMe page. I appreciate it very much. Thank you all so much. <laughs> So uh, I just, yeah, I want to want to thank Stacy and, and Ona's Legal Nova Scotia uh, Migrant Workers Program for, for uh, producing that, that great video. Uh, and uh, so if you have questions and, and comments, uh, I encourage you to use the, the Q&A or the, the chat room and we're going to go back. Uh, we're going to hear from Stacy um, uh, more. Uh, but now I just wanted to go uh, to Emilio. Um, so Emilio, in the report that we're launching today, uh, we write, denying public health coverage based on immigration status is not an accidental oversight, but a conscious decision embedded in Canadian public policy. So can you can you unpack that <laughs> statement for us? Tell us more about uh, these policies that this report highlights and, and the recommendations that, that need to be made now? Definitely. Thank you very much, Tracy. I want to start by thanking the Canadian Health Coalition for hosting this webinar and to you personally, Tracy, for collaborating with me on authoring this report. I also want to send my thanks to Deepan and Stacey, who are here with us to share as well. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with um, stating the report's main recommendation, which is very straightforward. We're asking the government to extend public health care coverage to all Canadian residents. That's that's our main ask, and it, it's quite simple. It's quite straightforward. But it we we dissect why that is not the case at this point, and the quote that you mentioned uh, is really relevant for that. I also want to clarify the scope of the report. We're dealing specifically with barriers at the policy level. We know that healthcare is a big issue in this country. It was actually stated as a top concern for Canadians in a recent Nanos poll that that went out last week. Uh, and there are many barriers that people experience because of uh, factors like their socioeconomic status, gender identity, race, and others. Uh, and while those are really important, we also believe that there are other studies that deal with, with those uh, impacts. And we want to focus specifically on immigration status as a barrier to access public health care coverage. Uh, so with that said, I want to highlight a few of the instances that demonstrate why this is a, a critical issue. If Canadians are seeing that access to healthcare is an issue at large, I want to say that for migrants, for refugees, for people without immigration status, these barriers are exacerbated 
to a different degree. So first I wanna talk about people that don't have immigration status. Conservative estimates suggest that the, there are at least 500,000 people without status in Canada, at least. Um, many of them are actively seeking to regularize the status, but as we know, pathways for regularization are severely limited. The second category that I wanna highlight are um, people that are coming under certain immigration streams, such as the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program. Um, we just heard about some of the barriers that, and the precarity that's embedded in the design of those programs, but I wanna highlight a few. The main, one of the main issues is that um, there are certain limits in terms of, or requirements in terms of the length of the contract uh, for people to be able to access healthcare. Also, in many instances, healthcare is tied to the, to the specific employer, uh, and the employer has to be the one that guarantees access to either provincial uh, government healthcare or private insurance. A report in 2015 by the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives found that 92% of Mexican farm workers surveyed in BC who were eligible for provincial health insurance were not signed up by the employer. 92%. So this is a second barrier. Programs that have, immigration programs that in themselves have precarity embedded and that have, uh, that are systematically excluding people from accessing healthcare. The third, uh, the third category I wanna highlight are um, temporary students uh, and workers, um, or rather student workers and other categories of workers that have uh, temporary residence status in the country. Uh, during specific times during their stay in Canada, uh, this, these individuals may lack complete uh, coverage of, of public health care. Um, and this can last from, you know, several months to years. Uh, we see in provinces like Ontario where um, international students, even though they pay significantly higher fees than domestic stu students, they're still not covered by, uh, by provincial health care. There's also the category of maintained status, which is individuals that are in between applications. Uh, so for example, from a work permit, from a study permit to a work permit. And in many provinces, uh, during that time in which their applications are being processed, they, they also don't have access to status. And for people that have dealt with IRCC and with immigration applications, you can understand these processes are very long and complex. So I hope these examples show a little bit of the barriers that we identify in the report. We've developed this at length, um, but what we're dealing with here is an issue that affects hundreds of thousands of Canadian residents. This is not a small issue. It's one that excludes many, many people from the system. And that's why when we're talking about this webinar, we ask the question, is the Canadian healthcare system truly universal? From this barrier that bars hundreds of thousands of people from, 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 from access to healthcare, we say that as it's currently functioning, it's not truly universal. So again, I wanna reiterate our policy recommendations. We're asking for individuals that are residing in Canada to get access to public healthcare. And one of the, the, the main ways in which we can achieve that is through getting them permanent residency. So that's why the, the recommendations of the report are really aligned with the call for status for all or permanent residence for all, and a demand for broad regularization programs for, for non-status individuals. We're also asking that in the meantime, as we achieve this change of getting permanent residence status for, for, for all migrants in the country, we're asking uh, provincial governments to provide healthcare to all temporary residents that is untied to their employer or employment status for as long as the residence in Canada lasts. There is no justification to deny fundamental rights and social benefits to individuals based on their immigration status. And we contend that even from a purely financial standpoint, we should, which should not supersede human rights obligations, these residents pay income taxes and contribute abundantly to the growth of Canada's economy. Funding the same programs and bolstering the workforce of the very healthcare system that excludes them. So we present them as a major injustice uh, and these are the, the main policy recommendations uh, that we put forward. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Emilio. Um, uh, so uh, um, 
we do in the report on, I think, page eight, we, we tell the story of Deepa Mbula Koti um, as a way to describe the refusal of, of care uh, for stateless, non-status people. Uh, we have Deepang with us today. So um, Deepang, can you can you share with us your story of trying to access health care in Ottawa, in, in Canada? Sure. First of all, I'd like, to say, I'd like to thank all the panelists and all the organizers for this um, event. Uh, my journey started in 2009, where I was arbitrarily taken away. My citizenship was taken away, and I have lost all status to any type of medical care. Fast forwarding, um, I had an accident where I was burned. When I, when I burned 20% of my body, I was taken to the hospital at Code 4, and I, was, I resided at that hospital for approximately nine days, give or take a day or so. That's when re reality really hit me because I needed treatment, I needed medication, um, I need follow-up care, and all these processes were not covered in any way. And I had to pay out of pocket. And if I did not pay out of pocket, I was not getting those services other than the fact that uh, being dealt with at the hospital. Insurance itself, from being someone that's stateless, there's only a very few companies that actually cover someone that's actually stateless for some odd, or odd reason. I'm not sure why. And dealing with the process of different departments, for example, you go to the hospital, they deal with the situation because it's urgent and it's life-threatening or it's problematic but if i wanted to do um, a follow-up treatment or anything else i would be barred unless i pay from the initial process and then getting um, bills from several different departments throughout the hospital and then getting collected it becomes a very stressful situation you're already injured you're already in a precarious vulnerable position and then on top of that, you're not dealing with a medical problem, which is obviously exasperating your mentality issues or exasperating um, different issues that are transpiring at that time. As a person that's being stateless or as a person that has no status, it's already a struggle on a daily day basis. So that was one experience that I, I'm sharing today that uh, really showed an experience that the difficulty uh, not having access to medical care, even though prior, or if you have a work permit and you're working, you're paying into taxes, but yet you're not getting the services. To me, it's mind boggling that we are a signatory to universal healthcare under the international obligations. And then there's different case laws from Supreme Court in Canada, establishing through section seven, when people are, are in precarious statuses, yet still to this day, no province, or in Canada allows universal access, which is just appalling. And that, that's how I will close with that. Yeah, thank you, Deepan. We'll, we'll definitely come back to you. And, and just remind folks, if you have questions for, for any of our panelists, please use the, the Q&A or the, or the chat room. Um, uh, uh, okay, so I'm going to go to Stacy now. Um, so that, yeah, like the video so clearly explains Karen's struggle, but can you tell us more about um, the healthcare challenges facing migrant workers and people with precarious immigration status in Nova Scotia. Um, we know that Karen struggles not an isolated one. So, what needs to change too? Thank you. Uh, so yes, we regularly hear uh, from workers who are facing issues uh, such as uh, health concerns and challenges being able to access health care because uh, oftentimes they have to rely on their employer uh, and the employer may not want to take them to get health care. There's also the issue of medical repatriation. Um, so for example, um, if a worker has a health concern, um, the employer may want to uh, quickly send them back if they have a work workplace injury. Instead of the worker being able to apply for workers' compensation, they may just be sent back. Um, so this is a concern that uh, that that we uh, and uh, something that we've seen happen uh, on a regular basis. Um, and in terms of the healthcare coverage itself, it is quite limited. Um, we've, uh, for example, seen that migrant workers in the seasonal agricultural workers program uh, with, um, we're working with uh, a Mexican worker who was injured. And uh, when we called 
uh, with him, the insurance company, they said he only gets access to one non-emergency medical visit. Um, so it's just uh, so limited. And also with Carrie Ann, we've seen that um, their coverage is only up to 100,000. And so, um, yeah, when you're uh, like in Carrie Ann's case, um, that's a serious medical condition that's not sufficient uh, to cover um, the care that she needs. Um, and in terms of um, in terms of what should change, uh, we are advocating uh, for uh, for MSI coverage uh, for everyone in the province, regardless of immigration status. And uh, similarly to what's been shared, uh, yeah, it, it shouldn't, healthcare should not be tied to someone's employment. Um, we see like in Carrie Ann's situation, she's in such a vulnerable situation because she was um, terminated from her job um, after she got sick. And now she doesn't, uh, her uh, health insurance, uh, private health insurance has also been terminated. She ha so she currently has no coverage. Uh, we also are advocating for an end to medical repatriation. Um, and also, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we're also uh, part of the uh, migrant led movement for uh, full and permanent immigration status for all migrants, which would enable um, all migrants in the country to have access to essential services like healthcare. Thank you. Th thanks, Stacey. Um, uh, so just go, we'll go back to Emilio. Uh, so uh, the report debunks a number of, of myths, including the, the notion that, that people uh, come to Canada to engage in health tourism. Uh, so described in the report is, is the case of Nell Toussaint. Uh, so can you tell us more about um, this this groundbreaking case and, and debunk the, the health tourism uh, myth for us? Yes, definitely. Before that, I just want to add, because I think Stacey raises a really important point around permanent status for all. Um, and just to, to expand on that, um, the, the way to get consistent healthcare coverage in Canada, the, the, the most, uh, the safest way is to obtain either permanent status and then, you know, citizenship. Those are two categories of individuals across the country which consistently have healthcare coverage, at least in terms of the public in, uh, public health insurance. Um, so that I just wanted to clarify that because I think it's a really important point to keep in mind when we're talking about other forms of temporary residence. That's why it's critical to also bring in the status for all campaign uh, because that would be a, a, an important pathway to get them to have uh, access to public uh, health insurance. Um, but going back to, to the question that you raised, Tracy, and thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the Nelta Sands case. Um, so for over, Nelta Sands has been in Canada for over 23 years. And for many of those, she has been without status. Uh, she repeatedly tried to obtain regularization. And for many years, she was denied. Um, she became ill. And after trying to regularize her status, she received permanent residence. Uh, but at that time, she had suffered irreversible sickness. Um, so the, this case is, is, is a landmark case because um, it really reveals some of the uh, ways in which the Canadian government is not fulfilling its human rights obligations, as Deepan, as Deepan mentioned. Um, at the international level, the UN has condemned Canada for the Nell Toussaint case. Uh, and, and now um, Toussaint, Ms. Toussaint is seeking um, uh, some form of, um, of, of response from the Canadian government uh, to account for the damages that she has received in the form of lack of access to, to, to public health care. Um, so I want to highlight a few of the things that this case uh, brings up about the way in which the Canadian government approaches health care for migrants. Uh, the concept of health tourism, which was utilized in this case, is that uh, the government sees that individuals are trying to get to Canada to milk the welfare system, to take advantage of the welfare system. And in some ways, uh, the barriers to access healthcare for temporary residents, for migrants in Canada, for people without immigration status, are to uh, deter this health tourism from happening. So in the face of this, I want to ask the question, who is taking advantage of who in reality? This report is titled, Work, Study, Pay Taxes, But Don't Get Sick. And I think that summarizes in a way what we're trying to advance. That is the fact that Canada is bringing in people to work, bringing in people to fill in some labor gaps. Um, it's 
positioning himself as an as a, as a, as a international leader, uh, not only welcoming refugees, but also as being a, a haven for workers uh, and a haven for human rights. Yet they continue to exclude these very people from the systems that they help fund. And this is a fundamental principle that I, we have stated again and again, I think, even in this panel. This is not a matter of, um, of charity, it's a matter of justice. We're having workers, we're having individuals here that are contributing to the Canadian uh, economy and to Canadian communities in substantive ways and that are barred from accessing uh, healthcare. And in this conversation, I also wanna bring, back, bring it back to the Canada Health Act, which was enacted, I believe in 1986. Uh, and extends access to healthcare for all Canadian residents. That's the language that the that, that, that Canada Health Act utilizes. Now, in the current configuration, provinces have the discretion of determining who is and is not a resident, and therefore who is eligible to access healthcare. We contend that, you know, in the 1980s, Canada didn't have these programs for temporary workers to the extent that they have it now. Even this, we've seen that this trend has increased uh, in recent years. Uh, for example, in December 2021, there were approximately 777,000 temporary foreign workers in Canada and 350,000 new international students. So that's more than a million temporary residents in the country. This, uh, this figure has increased sevenfold from 2000. Uh, so we're seeing an increasing reliance of the Canadian government on temporary residents, but Many provinces refuse to consider them as, as residents for the for the purposes of uh, of receiving healthcare. And while they refuse to consider them as residents for that for those purposes, they're still taking provincial and federal taxes from these individuals. So this is the big disconnect that we're trying to highlight. It's it's not that migrants are trying to milk the system. I think we should question whether Canada is trying to milk migrants in a sense, whether they're trying to take advantage of, 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 of migrants. Um, I think if people are in this country contributing to, to all the things that we have mentioned in the past, they should be eligible to access the very systems uh, that they support. And to finish off, I just wanna go into the basic principles that we're highlighting. Um, Canada purports to hold the principles of welcoming uh, people from all over the world. It also purports to hold uh, or to respect the principle of universal access to healthcare. So we believe this is imperative uh, for, for every Canadian uh, to advocate for access to healthcare to all Canadian residents. It's a matter of principle, it's a, man, it's a matter of justice and of human rights. And it's not a matter of charity. We believe that it's just uh, what individuals are owed based on what they contribute uh, to society and based on their inherent human rights. Um, so. That would be my response. Um, again, health tourism is, an, is a statement that informs many of these policies, but we have yet to see uh, its backing in, in actual practice. In reality, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, migrants are getting the shorter end of the stick. Thank you, Emilio. Um, I should have also said that panelists can respond to other panelists at any time, so just uh, raise your hand. Um, we are getting to the end of my questions, and then we will go to the audience questions. I do see, I just want to acknowledge folks that are in the audience, too. I do see a number of folks with Migrant Workers Alliance for Change and uh, and um, some experts that we relied on who helped us review our report, like YY Chen um, uh, and, and others, um, and uh, folks with unions that, that work on supporting migrant health care too. Um, so I'm going back to, to Deepen. Uh, so um, yeah, you are someone who has had direct experience with being unable to access health care. Uh, so what do you think the Canadian government should do for, for you and others um, with your status? And, and what should allies uh, who, who believe in public health care access for, for everyone do? So for the first part, I would state that um, having access, universal access to all, regardless of status, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, in regards to policies, I also agree that there should be a policy implemented on the federal and provincial level of disregarding these limitations and these restrictions that are imposed. If you're paying, regardless if you're not paying, uh, you're coming to Canada, Canada has, a, a view of 
encouraging people to come to Canada at the same time, you are contributing in whichever way. You're either studying, you're doing work, things of this nature. So anything you do, essentially you're paying, to, you're paying provincial tax or federal tax in some form, some way. So you should definitely have access to healthcare. It's very important to have access to proper medical care because it, it can also um, put a detrimental impact on your daily life as well as your family. And again, the, the, the anguish that comes along with not knowing or having the stability of having proper health care is always a, a concern at the same time. Caring back to what individuals or uh, organizations can do, I would say that uh, push parliamentary individuals and policymakers to make change and that could be a form of uh, lobbying, or that could be a form of filing constitutional challenges or doing charter challenges to get remedies to this problem, to have a proper fix, to make sure that everyone has proper health care. That's how I would respond to the broader question. And then there's always also the grassroots organization as well, grassroots activism to also push as well. Thank you. Thank you, Deepan. Uh, and I see that that Hassan has uh, put in the in the chat that uh, uh, that uh, yeah Hassan says uh, cabinet is discussing regularization and permanent resident status for migrants in December and January. Send them a message now, urging them to ensure equal rights, including access to health care, by guaranteeing permanent resident status for all. And uh, Hassan's included a link there that you can go to to, to take action. Uh, I know that many of us here have have been participating in in that uh, campaign, but uh, yeah, we we need to keep working on that. Um, so I'm going to go to the the questions uh, that we have here. Um, so the the first question. Um, says great report <laughs> do you have a breakdown of what the various rules are around access to health for migrants in in different provinces um, maybe Emilio do you want to take that one <laughs> yeah definitely um I think that's a really important point and um, as we continue working on this issue is a tool that would be really useful to develop um, I think with this uh, with this report we wanted to highlight some of the main trends and main main barriers that we were seeing uh, at a national level uh, but we recognize since healthcare is, is a provincial is at the provincial jurisdiction that um, that policies and, and advocacy can can also happen at the provincial must happen at the provincial level and that it will look differently for for each province. Um, I will say that um, we I, I would be eager to connect more with um, with a provincial uh, actors that are that are moving this conversation forward as as Stacy is in, in in Nova Scotia. Uh, and to see how we can nuance this language and the recommendations for the provincial uh, governments as well. Uh, but we wanted to get a report that um, put attention at the national level because e even though we're seeing some positive, positive developments, for, for example, BC has, um, has removed uh, the barrier for people on maintain status, um, we know that the, the, this logic around, um, around creating this barrier so that migrant, migrants don't take advantage of the system is, is is something that happens at the federal level, so uh, it was important for us to to touch uh, to touch that aspect first. Uh, but I think that will be a really important uh, way to move forward to kind of identify more provincial actions that arise from the report. Well, thanks, Emilio. Uh, maybe just to go to the chat, I see Sri um, Murat has uh, commented about the recent changes announced by our IRCC allowing international uh, students to, to work for more than 24 hours, the previous limit to alleviate shortages in the labor force. Uh, uh, they say, especially work which pays minimum wage, however, student health coverage is supposed to address if they get sick. I would like to know if the student coverage would actually cover work-related injuries. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know if, Amelia, do you wanna <laughs> take that one too or, or uh, another panelist? I think my my answer would be similar. I think it's um, getting into the nitty gritty of what uh, each province covers and um, and 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 whether it's uh, public, whether it's private insurance, and 
and all that dynamic is it's important. Um, and I would leave it to someone that has um, a specific knowledge of, of a province. Uh, I just want to highlight why that uh, though this disparity is also uh, point to the importance of the recommendations that we present. Um, you know, in addition to the to the to the federal one, which we have already mentioned, a status for all. Um, we're also calling for provinces to provide uh, healthcare coverage for all their residents on tied to employment for the entire duration of their stay in Canada. Uh, in the meantime, you know, as until the permanent residency is granted to to, to these individuals. Um, I think if if that doesn't occur, then we can begin to see disparities in what you mentioned, for example, whether a particular private insurance covers work-related injuries or not. Um, I think that's where we also begin seeing those problems. And I'm not trying to say that those problems are not also present in the public health care system. I think they are. Um, but that's why I think it's important that we at least have an equal floor um, and that we guarantee that um, that migrants and, and really all residents in Canada have access to this public health care coverage and are not facing different policies by each province and 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 many of these that would be private insurance policies. So um, I don't know if um, Stacy, you might have more knowledge on specifically for Nova Scotia if you would like to to share more. Thank you. Uh, could could you repeat the question? Um, it was related to international students, and uh, it's going back up to the like uh, whether like the changes that were that were made um, to allow international students to work more than uh, twenty four hours, and whether the yeah that student health coverage is supposed to. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> if the student coverage would cover work-related injuries, and I do see that Hassan has also responded in the chat, so I don't, do you see that, or uh, <laughs> or if you want to go ahead, <laughs> Stacey? Uh, yes, I think that uh, covers it. Um, there are uh, some sectors where migrant workers are, uh, well, where people are not covered by workers uh, compensation. Um, workers compensation is province by province. Um, so I'm more familiar with workers compensation in relation to uh, migrant workers, but yes, I agree with what Hassan is saying um, that, yeah, uh, they, that they uh, should be covered if the employer is making uh, contributions and doesn't stop uh, the worker from applying for workers compensation. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think maybe maybe we'll go to the, the next question in the audience from Dorothy Wigmore, um, who does work with the migrant farm worker projects with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario workers. Uh, so Dorothy says, did you look at health coverage for farm, farm workers who get sick or hurt because of their job? Employers or workers might not want to make workers' compensation claims for a bunch of reasons. So healthcare is, is an important fallback. Access, language issues, and more can be problematic. Yes, that's an important point. Uh, again, I don't know if, uh, Amelia, do you wanna respond to that? I can also quickly say that there are, um, there, yeah, there are, uh, I, I just look at, see who's in the room too, like Wabai Chen and, uh, uh, and there are other research projects too, looking at at, at these at, at this as well. I'm I'm part of the temporary foreign workers maritimes research project um, that I'll I'll put that in in the in the chat too. That talks about some of these barriers that uh, Dorothy mentions. Uh, but I don't know, Amelia, did you want to to talk about it in relation to our report? <laughs> I think um, yeah, I would defer to to you, Tracy, and 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 again to. Uh, Stacy, as, as you have worked more directly with um, people in, in a SAW program, for example, um, we did highlight some of the precarity that, that's embedded in those programs uh, and, and issued specific recommendations for that. Um, but I, yeah, I would defer more specific comments to you both if you have anything else directly to that question. I know that one of the things that uh, I'm also with the, the Madhu Verma Migrant Justice Center here in New Brunswick, and um, one of the things that we're working on right now uh, that we want to make a focus of our uh, uh, a priority action, I guess, for our group is uh, 
getting rid of the um, the three month wait that uh, temporary foreign workers have to wait to get access to to, to health care or public health care. Uh, many of them, yeah, their their work permits are so short that they are never eligible for for health care. So. We will be working on that in New Brunswick, uh, trying to get rid of that that waiting period, um, where uh, we feel that temporary foreign workers, as soon as they enter the province, should be granted um, access to to healthcare to to a Medicare card. Um, maybe we'll go to the next question. Um, so, uh, Jishan um, asks, we we all know data is a powerful tool in driving policy changes. Do we have the the real time numbers talking about structured barriers to access for healthcare for all Canadians, especially BIPOC communities. I can respond to that one and link directly to a section in the report. Um, so, in the section access to healthcare and COVID 19, we showed a, a, some of this data uh, specifically with BIPOC and migrant communities. Um, so, we found that um, migrants and racialized communities are overrepresented in frontline occupations, including food production and healthcare. And that uh, the research has also shown that they, uh, that migrants, particularly those holding a temporary status, face much lower access to COVID-19 testing and COVID-related healthcare in Canada than, than Canadian citizens and permanent residents. Um, we also referenced a study that had data from 2000 to 2010 by the Canadian Community Health Survey which found that uh, migrants overall, and particularly um, th that among migrants overall, sorry, uh, white migrants and those with higher income uh, were more likely to have a regular doctor. Um, the research also suggests that the time since immigration is a, is a really uh, good predictor of, of the access to healthcare that migrants experience. And this might be linked to, uh, to status as well, because as we know, there are certain streams um, that require uh, individuals to be in the country for a certain period of time before they can apply for, for permanent residence. Um, so this is a bit of the data that we reference in the, in the report. Um, I think there's certainly more, and I wouldn't be surprised if there are important data gaps, uh, but from what we've seen, Yes, there are very, um, very strong barriers, and it's important to highlight that when we say barriers for migrants to access healthcare, uh, the programs are not made equal. Uh, we have certain programs that have precarity embedded in them, uh, and we also know that the outcomes uh, depend on, on on many other factors, uh, and that often communities that are racialized uh, and lower income are the ones that will face uh, more barriers. So. Um, just wanted to add that regarding the, the research that we referenced. Yeah, and I think like the, these policies are, are are changing. It seems like every day there seems like there's an announcement from IRCC. Um, maybe these, and of course, a lot of these policies are not changing as fast as we all would like them to change too. So I I kind of see maybe a future updated report by us too. And I think yeah, thanks to the like the work that like Deep and Stacy and Carrie Ann are. And many of you here today are, are doing, uh, you know, these these policies are are changing. Um, uh, I think Zhijian had another question about data indicating how the pandemic has has. Is, is there any sorry data indicating how the pandemic has significantly marginalized further the the communities who are already um, suffering? Um, there have been some, I guess I can maybe jump in here. I know that there there have been, um, yeah, some research is, is, is coming out now looking at um, how um, access to, to medicine um, was significantly, uh, uh, it was much harder for racialized uh, communities, immigrant communities to access medicine during the pandemic. Uh, uh, I can maybe throw up the, the link there to, to that uh, report. Uh, and um, but maybe there, I know that there's lots of experts here. So if anybody wants to to also chime in with any um, uh, information, uh, and yes, please ask your questions. I'm gonna make sure that I'm not. And if any panelists wants to jump in, <laughs> oh, Hassan, you have a question about campaigns around farmer care right now, and if you see there's a way to to link the call for health care for all with farmer care expanding. 
Yes, <laughs> I think that's it. it's really important that we, uh, of course, uh, to do that. And uh, there is a, a PharmaCare Alliance uh, that the Canadian Health Coalition is part of, and uh, and the Council of Canadians uh, is also um, uh, uh, part of this alliance. And we definitely want to bring together uh, 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 the migrant advocates, so the uh, and and others um, around our our campaign to have universal <laughs> pharmacare, um, for sure. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to add. Oh, thank you, Dorothy. That was uh, the coroner's report, yes, from Ontario about migrant farm, farm worker COVID-related deaths. Uh, yes, that's an important um, report that um, that highlights, uh, yeah, how COVID has affected migrant farm workers. Um, and, oh, okay. I, sorry, I'm just going back and looking at the questions. Um, Roland asks, hi, Roland, <laughs> you asked under the, the temporary foreign worker program, do you know the coverage of required employers, private health insurance for the migrant workers that are not covered with provincial health programs? Um, I believe that's a question asking about like what's covered under private health insurance plans, maybe. Uh, we do know that um, that there's many things that are not covered under the private health insurance that employers are are, are required <laughs> to uh, provide uh, temporary farm workers while they they wait for their Medicare cards. Um, I think that's what <laughs> that is asking. But Roland, if you want to clarify to uh, um, uh, and that I know that Roland and I and others have, have uh, worked here in New Brunswick supporting temporary foreign workers. And we, we know that uh, in many cases, it's not clear what is covered in the, the private and the public health plans. And that information is not being provided to, to temporary foreign workers uh, like it should be. <laughs> um. Yeah, and maybe I would just add a bit um, yeah, under the uh, Temporary Foreign Worker Program, uh, we, we have the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, which is uh, based on bilateral agreements. So there's a Canada-Mexico contract for migrant workers. There's a Canada-Caribbean workers contract. And in the contract, uh, it states that in the contracts that uh, basically uh, migrant workers should have access to a private health coverage until they get access to the public health care coverage. But in Nova Scotia, if you're a migrant worker, you have to have a one year work permit to be eligible for public health care. Um, we have called the insurance company uh, and like, uh, like have uh, received like a, a document that states what is uh, and isn't included. But uh, yeah, normally they would only share that with like a client. Um, so yes, it is. Uh, we do hear regularly from workers that they don't know what's covered. Thanks, Stacey. And I see that Dorothy makes that important point about um, in the chat uh, about how Ontario workers do get um, instant coverage for healthcare now. I guess with that, uh, that's uh, at the onset of COVID and beginning of 2020, the, the Ford government did uh, provide uh, or is still, I think, providing um, healthcare for, for those who were previously not covered under OPIP. So yeah, like Dorothy says, wondering if there's not a way to go after New Brunswick Health funding through the feds for discriminating against migrant workers with that three month wait. Yes, for sure. I think there are different ways that we could go about that, whether it's, you know, like we are, we are calling for the the, the province to, uh, to eliminate that that three month waiting period. Um, there's also, yeah, asking the feds, I guess, to extend the interim federal health program um, to uh, to temporary foreign workers too, um, but, or, and then other, other ways, yeah, like that Dorothy mentions around, uh, uh, um, challenges around, uh, discriminating against, uh, migrant workers, um, with these waiting periods. Um, okay, is there any other, oh, it's more, um, comments and questions, um, Dorothy says that, uh, Dorothy's happy to, to chat with folks and I'm seeing people wanting to, to connect. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm being asked to share my email. So I'm gonna do that in the chat. Um, and uh, let me see the, there's another. 
yeah i can try to make the the chat the transcript of the of the chat available dorothy um i see that janet has a comment <laughs> um so uh janet says i'm involved in research and advocacy for access to health care for uninsured migrants in quebec it would be extremely interesting to have some type of forum where people concerned with these issues could exchange information about the situation in their respective provinces, in particular positive policies or practices. For example, in Quebec, under a law adopted in 2021, all children under 18 are entitled to provincial health insurance no matter where they were born and what their parents' migratory status is. The only condition is that the family intends to live in Quebec for six months or more. This is a major gain that would be good to publicize Although, of course, still a long way from our goal of truly universal health care coverage for all. Um, and I think that that's, it's a, that's an important point to make. Uh, while we, we talk about, you know, the importance of temporary foreign workers to our economy, we have to also remember that, you know, that humans <laughs> deserve, uh, all humans deserve health care access. And uh, um, maybe, uh, so I, I'm not seeing Ruth asked, but if I as an Ontario resident moved to New Brunswick, I would have the same three month wait for a New Brunswick health card. Yes, I believe that's true. But what we're asking for, because temporary foreign workers who come here often with these short work permits and never have access to health care, um, you know, that they sh this should be eliminated for them. But uh, Emilio or anyone else, I don't know if you want to add to that <laughs> comment about waiting periods. <laughs> Yes, I want to, I guess one brief comment about waiting periods is that the same idea of health tourism is also applied to justify them, um, which is uh, a contradiction because we're talking in many cases about people that uh, do hold tem either a temporary resident status that allows them to study or work in Canada, which is a sign of, of residence, they're not a, a, a tourist. Um, and it's also applied uh, to certain categories of, of resettled refugees, for example, that are that are coming permanently to the country. Um, again, it's a contradiction because these are individuals that are staying in Canada um, for the long term, or or at least for for a, for a specific period of time that's beyond uh, that contemplated in a tourist visa. But uh, the three month waiting period has been justified in many instances as uh, deterring people from uh, engaging in health tourism. Um, and then I just want to briefly acknowledge the um, the comment by uh, Janet, which I think it's really important. Uh, I would love to see uh, momentum around this, and 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 as you as you suggest, uh, a gathering where people from different provinces can exchange some of this uh, positive developments. I really think that um, there are many positive developments happening, and and that that is just a a testament to how inconsistent these barriers are with the way in which we, at least uh, many people in this country envision access to healthcare. Uh, that's why we were appealing to uh, this, this principle uh, and, and specifically to the principle of universal access to healthcare. Um, we see this positive developments happening in Quebec. Uh, as I mentioned before, there, there are some positive developments happening in, in BC, but the, the way to truly uh, get consistent action across the country is to unify our asks and to to demand this, this access that is again untied to employment or or um, or the employer uh, for the entire duration of of the individual stay in Canada, and that is public health care coverage, and that paired with you know a call for a broad regularization program and, and permanent status for all, uh, so migrants can have consistent access to health care. So um, again, I think these it it would be good to connect advocacy at the different provinces. Uh, and I'm glad to see that there is there's some momentum in the chat, and um, I would be happy to participate in that as well. Okay, thank you, Emilio. Um, we're at the one hour mark, so maybe what I would ask panelists to do now is if you wanted to share some final thoughts uh, before before we go, and um, maybe who else wants to start. <laughs> I'm happy to start. Um, I would just say um, I want to really highlight uh, Carrie Ann, uh, just the bravery 
that it took for her to speak out. Uh, so often uh, migrant workers are afraid of reprisals against them, um, very real uh, risks to uh, their livelihoods um, and being able to provide for their families um, if they're not able to come back, uh, if, if there's reprisals against them. Um, so yeah, uh, Carrie Ann is speaking out uh, for herself, but also for, for other migrant workers, as she mentioned in the video. So it's, uh, yeah, just uh, really important uh, to, to hear her voice. And she couldn't be here uh, today because, uh, yeah, she's at the hospital. Um, but uh, yeah, just really wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. And uh, I, yeah, I hope that we can be part of uh, sharing Carrie Ann's uh, struggle as, as it goes forward and uh, and finding ways for us all to uh, to support Carrie Ann. Uh, Deepan, do you want to um, say any any words to, to leave us with? Sure. I would say that um, I always encourage other individuals to um, always push back against the system, essentially, and never give up on our goals and never no matter if there's defeats or wins keep on pushing forward because the broader change needs to happen where all individuals actually have proper health care in this country and i always and essentially keep on fighting the good fight and don't give up no matter what obstacles arise there's always a way to resolve those obstacles those that, that, that i'll close with that thank you Thank you, Deepan uh, and Emilio. <laughs> Any final thoughts? <laughs> yes, I would just like to reemphasize that what we're asking for is just what people are owed, um, and that our our asks are very clear, they're straightforward. Um, it 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 really follows into a matter of of justice, um, and I'm encouraged to see so many people working at the different levels on this. Um, and I think, as as others have said, I would I would love to continue collaborating and, and pushing this arguments at the federal level because I truly believe that um, first that many people are not aware of these barriers in Canada, um, and that I think appealing to to these principles um, can really help us move towards a point where um, justice is achieved for for all Canadian residents. Um, so that would be my closing words. Thank you for having me.